Good evening. I'm Kelly McCullen here with a very special North Carolina. Now we have an in-depth discussion with Bob Etheridge, the former congressman, legislator, state superintendent of public instruction and your gubernatorial candidate in the Democratic primary. Thank you, sir, for being on the show. Kelly, pleasure being with you. Thank you for letting me come and join you. I don't have to tell you how big 2010 was for the GOP, but in 2012, there are some high profile candidates for governor of the Democratic ticket who say, you know, we think we can win this thing. What are voters telling you that got you in this race? Well, they are really uh, upset at what happened in the General Assembly. The, uh, the things they did, not only the public education, but, but the whole realm of things. You know, wh whatever people really believe in our state. We're a state, historically, it's been a progressive state in the South. Uh, we've been a state that believed in education, believed in opportunity, job creation. All the things that they believe in have been under attack. Uh, and as I move across this state, there is a level of unrest that I haven't seen in a long time, and I think folks are willing, to, willing and ready to turn this thing around in 2012. Do you find that unrest is coming from just the period of time since the 2010 elections, or is this something that's going back years and years, and it's finally percolated to now, and people just don't know where to, where to go with, whether to vote Democrat, whether to vote Republican? Kelly, I think there's a combination of that. I think the education piece is going back several years. We have teacher and state employees who haven't had a raise in four years. We had high unemployment. Uh, we're in a situation where people have believed very strongly in North Carolina. Uh, actually, you can go back 30, 40 years. That education was that foundation that we built everything on. Uh, certainly, that's what got me in, in political life. I went into public service because of public education. I was in business for 19 years, and during those 19 years, I was a county commissioner, chairman of the board, a state legislator for 10 years during that period. But I got in it for that reason. Gosh, I got in it before we ha even had children, because I really believed education was how you build the future. Uh, it's what helped a poor farm kid from Johnston County, whose dad was a tenant farmer, have the opportunity to really live the American dream. I wouldn't have had the opportunities I've had for that reason. And I think that dream is under attack today unlike it's ever been in my lifetime. And I think the people of this state are starting to feel that, they're beginning to realize that. Uh, saying they're mad is probably uh, not the proper word. I think the better way to say it is they're anxious, they're concerned, and they're ready to see things change in a positive way and get this state back to where it is uh, respected as a leader in education, respected in the, as a state that's in the business of creating jobs and improving the opportunity for every person from pre-kindergarten all the way to our seniors in this state. Have we lost respect as a state with our peers around America? Well, I think people are looking at us. I do think when uh, legislators stand on the floor of the House in North Carolina or the United States Congress and belittle the people who teach our children belittle the people who provide the services to our state. Uh, you know, it's amazing. It's, uh, they'll stand up and say, well, you know, it's a great job when they got the snow off the road and they did all these things. And then at other times when it comes to reward them and thank them for the job they've done, they want to be critical. That is not acceptable in North Carolina. We respect everyone and we respect the hard work and we're grateful for it and we ought to do it every day, not just when things like that happen. Governor Perdue's late choice not to run for re-election is set a scramble off in the Democratic primary. I mean, that's just the best sure. way to put that. But for those weeks you have to run, everything I've seen with you in the media is you're staking your claim to public education. That's what you're running on in this primary. Why do you focus on that as opposed to jobs or all the other things we hear candidates talk about? Great question, and it's an appropriate question. Uh, you know, I've, I've been about building from the ground up since I got in public service. And education is the foundation you build it on. You know, if you want to have a better opportunity in life, all of us can say it's education. If you want to grow a business, it's about having education. North Carolina is where we are and where we've been because we have a great community college system. Uh, started on a fellow by the name of Terry Sanford and it's been expanded. We have a, one of the best university systems in the world and yet that's under attack by uh, cutting back for our professors and others who are leaving this state uh, and not and taking uh, federal contracts and uh, other grants with them, those are jobs. So you do it if you don't have a strong, vibrant 
education system. North Carolina has been looked at for 50 years as a leader in this country, not just in the South, as an education leader. I fear that unless we recommit ourselves to education excellence, we're going to continue to slide backwards. That will have a negative impact on our job creation and the opportunities for the next generation. I'm not willing to sit on the sidelines and allow that to happen. Looking at that state budget from 2011 that the GOP passed with the five Democrat crossovers over the veto, the GOP will tell you, anybody, that the level of funding between what Governor Purdue wanted and what they got passed was 0.5%. Is that one half of 1% enough to sink education, to put everything at risk, like I've heard from so many other candidates, and you say all of a sudden states are looking at us and wondering if we're up to par? Kelly, I was chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House for four years, served on the Appropriations Committee for eight, uh, have worked in Congress on budgets. You can take figures and make them do whatever you want them to do. Truth is, it's not the numbers, it's where you put those numbers. How, who, what do you decide is your first priority? And you've got to have priority for helping the people who help our children every day. And that's education at every level, pre-kindergarten through the university. And you have to decide, are you going to invest in education or are you going to spend money on other things? And I say invest because education is an investment. It's not an expenditure. You invest money in education and roads and bridges and things that give you long-term return or you spend money on prisons. And I promise you, if you don't invest in education, if you don't invest in people, you will spend money on prisons. I think, uh, I think there, it's, a, it's a slide of hand deal when you make those dis conversational talks that they're talking about. Uh, the numbers may be the same, but the priority is a woefully inadequate and off course. So intent As means governor, a lot to you. I will set priorities that are entirely different than what they did. And they had an opportunity to do the right thing and they chose not to do what the right thing. What would have thing. been the right thing? Well, I think the right thing would do would fund those, those priorities that make a difference for the future, that allow North Carolina to continue to grow and prosper and not lay You cannot move forward by laying off teacher and teacher assistants, laying off university professors, cutting curriculums, cutting the opportunities at the community college system at a time when we have high unemployment, you need people to get there and get the courses, to get retrained, to get jobs. You just don't improve it that way. And you do it by keeping the resources to meet those needs. But the battle of the mind out there in the voter, you have the conservative-leaning groups putting radio ads out there saying that the GOP budget, in fact, uh, provided funding for 2,000 state-funded teaching positions, 4,600 education positions, the left groups, the Democrat progressive groups say, wait a minute, like you've called it, sleight of hand. Were people laid off? And if they were laid off and the position made vacant, were new people hired? How, did the, how does this work and what is the voter exposed, you know, supposed to think about this? Let me see if I can explain it so the public will understand. You, you may have kept funding where you went. You send it out to the local education agency. I was superintendent for eight years. I know how this worked. But what they said in the budget, oh, and by the way, we want you to send this much money of what we sent back at the end of the year. Hello? If you're going to send the money back, you can't hire people with that money. And even though you have the level of funding, you've got more students showing up at the public school door every day, so the average dollar per student goes down. That's why we're below every state to include Mississippi. We can't be proud of that. I can't imagine how the General Assembly can be proud of it. Secondly, in addition to that, at the end of this year, in September, the fiscal year, there's $247 million of federal money that they railed against when we appropriated, but now the schools were using it to save those teacher and teacher assistants. That will go away in September. It's going to be interesting to see what the next General Assembly does to fill that hole, plus the re what's called a reversion they've got to give this year, and they're going to reach back and get it next year. So to say you appropriate it and then take it back is at best disingenuous, but the public will understand it's nothing more than blatant lie. Governor Purdue will be using her final few months in office to tout a sales tax, uh, temporary or permanent. I'm not sure yet what, is, what the proposal is. What do you think of using the sales tax to fund education or your opponent, Bill Faison, says fund job creation? Uh, sales tax is a good policy. It is if you give those at the lower income some credits for paying it, but... Uh, they should not have, uh, have repealed it last time. We wouldn't be in this mess we're in right now and arguing about how we take care of education for the long term. Kelly, the problem with it, that, and the public understand this, the public's really not 
uninformed. They're pretty smart. They understand that a child does not know what they need. A child only knows what they get. And you don't get a second chance when that child is ready and the teacher's got a bigger class. You know, for the folks who are very, very critical of what teachers do, they ought to go in that classroom and spend one full class and a full day, not just walk in and visit and walk out. Spend a day teaching with the tremendous challenge of the diversity of children. Uh, those are the, some real heroes of ours in this country, people who teach our children. That sales tax policy you're talking, you say the voters are not ignorant of this. They would pay the, probably pay the sales tax if you gave them a choice. Then why do state legislators, Democrat and Republican, or Democrats in this case was their policy, throw out the word temporary? When you could just as easily throw out the word permanent, and that would settle this issue with no sunset. Well, I think the reason it was intended to be temporary, because the economy had dropped down. You're trying to fill that gap in the down economy. And when the economy picks back up, there may not be a need for it. You know, because the economy starts to expand, you get the resources, unemployment goes down, revenues come into the state. There's no need to keep it when the economy is up. And I happen to agree they ought to call it a temporary, and it should be that as the economy picks back up. Let's that look, would make all the sense in the world. Let's break apart your education plan beginning with uh, pre-K and some reforms in the pre-K system or modifications to the names and, and so forth. What do you do with pre-K as Governor Etheridge and you release your ideas for a budget? The pre-K program needs to be funded. It needs to be expanded. There is no question that children who access to good pre-K education come to school ready to learn uh, in a proper setting. Uh, it makes it easier on the teachers all the way through. It reduces dropout rate. It increases student achievement. I mean, all the above, and it works. Uh, and it's been shown to work year after year after year. Uh, you can always find isolated situations. Children who come from parents who have resources, who have good education backgrounds, they do well because they have those things made available to them. But a child comes from a home who does not have books, doesn't have the opportunity to read and learn, uh, they need that pre-K. So if all kids do it and blend together, everyone wins. K through 12, a lot of changes there, a lot of potential sure. changes on the horizon. Let's start with the traditional public school model. Uh, you've, you've already opposed the teacher cuts and you want to push things back and restore that funding, but K through 12 as a model itself, uh, is it outdated? Did it need charter schools to compete with it? No. What it needs is nurturing, help, long, you know, what we, what we look at is we want short-term results for long-term planning. Think about it. Education is investment over the long term. The child's in school 12, 13 years. And you can't just treat them like a widget in a manufacturing situation. Do we need more technology in the schools? Absolutely. We need it up to date. We started with technology in the late 80s, early 90s. It made a difference. But you can't do away with that one-on-one -on -one with that teacher in the classroom. No technology. Well, technology is a tool to be used, not a tool to be used in, in substitute for a teacher. There are places where technology is terrific for distant learning, for special courses for students and others. But there are those students that are going to need that teacher one-on-one. -on -one. They've got to have it. And all of us can, can talk of the times when we had it. So it's a tool to be used. Republic and that'll change education in a big way. I was going to say, Republicans have campaigned on school reform, letting that sales tax expire in 2011, which it did. Uh, but they're going to say throwing more money at the public schools as they are currently structured just simply didn't work. Apparently, voters bought into that and, and believe in that, too. How do you change that mindset, or has situations changed and voters are seeing things differently? Well, I think if you look at the turnout last year, it was a low turnout, too, and that had an impact on it. But voters did buy into that. And uh, But I think people care about their children, they care about their grandchildren, they care about North Carolina, they care about this country. And you cannot, history has proven, you cannot move forward unless everyone does better. I think FDR, Franklin Della Roosevelt, had it right. He said, we'll all be better off when we all are better off. And that's the philosophy we all ought to adopt. It isn't about helping a few and leaving the rest. Public education is a great leveling device that levels the opportunity for everyone. It did for me. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am today, wouldn't have had the opportunity, and millions of others can say the same thing. Even Republican Pat McCrory says, you know, I could ask for more public education funding as governor, but I want to fix, and that was his term, fix the high school dropout rate. 
you want every child to graduate high school. Sure. But what's an acceptable and realistic dropout rate? You can look at high school teachers and educators and say, you know, you're doing the best job you can do under the circumstances. I don't think, I don't think there, Kelly, there is an acceptable dropout rate. Uh, that means you're, you're starting out with the premise that some people can fail. And I don't think you should do that. I think what you should say is, where our goal is to make every child get through, recognizing that in any business you're going to have problems. But children aren't products. Uh, and I think people who talk about fixing things reminds me of people who say, I'm going to fix things. You don't fix children. You don't fix education. You work to improve the opportunity and work with the people who are there. And you can't fix education, as some would call it, by beating up on the people who every day go in that classroom underpaid, underappreciated, and do the job. You get it. You help education improve by working with those who work every day, who come to work, work at night grading papers, work on the weekends, taking children to all kinds of programs and making life better, being volunteers for a host of things that they don't get paid for. Well, we, we've got them graduated. Let's move them on to community college and the universities. And I don't need to tell you, UNCTV, that we're part of the university. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. take my questions and size it up how fair I'm being to you. That's always sure. the problem we have as, as a university television network. But tuition going up, around 10% the next couple of years. And, and if we're facing austerity, as we're, as we're told, what's the answer for tuition in North Carolina? And compare it against the state constitution that says it needs to be as free as practical. I'm disappointed in the General Assembly. They didn't have to do it. They had a chance to keep the temporary uh, three-quarter cents. The constitution speaks to a, free, uh, a public education with tuition as low as practical. I think it was a, a horrible mistake. I think history will now prove that they've made that mistake. It is going to deny a lot of students who'd like to go to college not a chance not to get there. Uh, that's why we, when I was in Washington, we increased student loans, reduced the interest rate on them. But when a student comes out of college, for those who get in, with a huge debt, you have denied them the choices they'd like to make if they want to be a teacher, preacher, law enforcement, in any other public service area they want to get into, they got to pay off a huge loan. If you come out of college with a fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty thousand uh, dollar debt, then how do you buy a home, get married, do the things you want to do for your own children? I think we have to really visit that and make sure we do keep tuition low. And North Carolina has had a rich history of that. Uh, and I'm very disappointed, in General Assembly. I think the, uh, the Republican-led General Assembly made a horrible mistake when they did that and history will prove that. you think the university system could have absorbed these cuts without affecting students at all? No. No, because that's the reason your top professors are now starting to leave. And when that happens, those are the centers of energy that help create jobs. Look at the Research Triangle. Look at the Triad. Look at East Carolina. You know, where you have a major university with research, you have job creation around it, good jobs going to it, and the educational systems are stronger. And, and the more we enrich those areas and reach out to the rural areas, the better off we're going to be as a state. Well, there's quite a few of us out here in North Carolina well beyond our school age years, or at least we think we are. You could inherit an unemployment rate around 10% throughout North Carolina. How do you put people to work? Well, I think you do it in two ways. You don't put people to work by laying off the people who teach their children in the schools because you compound the problem. If, if, I'm, if you have public school teachers you're laying off, public employees, you lay enough of those off, that has an impact on the private sector. So if that impact, they buy goods and services. So it, it is a compounding problem that does not benefit. Now, you want government to work efficiently, uh, and it should. Every dollar should be spent wisely. But I happen to believe if you do those things right, then you wind up, people come to North Carolina. The first question a major employer will ask is looking for a job site in North Carolina is tell me about the education system in this community. That's, for, that's going to tell him what the quality of his employees are, where his workers are going to be going to school, kind of things that are going to happen. Uh, that's what a mayor told me the other day. I was a county commissioner first. I can tell you that's the first question. That's why I got involved in this uh, public service arena to begin with. We improved schools, then we put in water and sewer, 
And if you talk to any county commissioner worth their salt in this state, they'll tell you the same thing. When it comes to that job creation and job skills training, that, and folks who are caught in mid-career and they've been outsourced or, or simply gone, how much of the how much of the shift from job to jobless has been the result of technology just making folks obsolete in their skill set? You got some globalization issues. Of course, you've you're hearing that in the primary debate. How do you size that up? I think it's a combination of all that. But the bigger issue is getting those skill sets back. And, and we know as young students, it transfers to those of us who are adults. The older we are, the harder it is to, to retool our skill sets. So it takes longer. That's why our community college system in this state needs the resources to get there. That's why President Obama was the first president really to put major resources in in the Recovery Act going to our community college system. A recognition in addition to the job shifting, but a recognition of the retooling that was needed to help North Carolina and our country uh, move back into increasing employment. We're starting to see that at the federal level. Uh, North Carolina is having a harder time of that because we have had more people in the uh, manufacturing sector. What, what, where, do, where do you think the average manufacturing worker should focus their skills going forward? Because as governor, you're going to represent them, but there's some personal accountability out there. I think there's several areas. I think we're still going to have manufacturing that's going to be driven by high tech. I was in a textile plant, one in, uh, down in Sanford, producing more textile material because that's the first job I had right out of high school. I worked in a textile plant for a year before I went to college. There, then we had a lot of people in it. That same plant today would have maybe 10% of the people that were employed 30 years ago, 35 years ago in that plant because it's driven by technology. And the skills required to run any plant today, uh, even if you're doing welding, is much greater than it was 25, 30 years ago. So that's why it is so critical, this education component of training, retraining, and continuous training. Education, Kelly, is no longer a destination. In other words, you don't get a high school degree, a community college degree, a university degree, a master's, or PhD. It is a journey. It is a lifelong process. And the sooner we all adopt that philosophy and recognize we're going to continue to learn the rest of our lives, I think that in itself will help shift the skills to a much higher level and help us as a state uh, get out of this uh, funk we're in with uh, high unemployment. Listen to Governor Dalton on, on the campaign trail, singled out one of his opponents who voted for a trade agreement with a couple of countries, trying to think who could only pass that vote but you, or, or supported that trade agreement. It brings in the question globalization and trade, importing as well as exporting. What's the proper perspective, demagoguery aside, for the global markets and the imports coming in, outsourcing our workers, but exports going out, creating jobs? How does it balance? Well, it's a delicate balance, and that's why at the federal level they put money in through the Department of Commerce to help people who were displaced. But the one he cited, it was interesting because it generated $26 billion in revenues for agricultural products here in eastern North Carolina, $26 billion, and increased the employment opportunities with that piece. But it is a balance, uh, and it'll continue to be. If you know, what folks don't realize, for every fifth row of soybeans that's grown in North Carolina, it goes to export. So if we cut out our exports, number one, we'd lose more jobs, have less revenue, and our quality of life would increase. But I think we're going to continue to have that. That's one of those things as governor. Uh, that's why governors historically have gone to other countries, you know, mm -hmm. to sell our products. So if we're going to sell products, the challenge is the imports. I think the bigger question is, and this is not a state issue, but it's more of a federal issue with the state. How do we uh, regulate the imports coming in and make sure these other countries play by the rules? And the current administration is doing a much better job than others have of punishing those countries for violating our trade treaties. This last minute we have left. When you get to go, you can call it Republicans during the campaign. You may end up working with a whole lot of them. What do they think of you? Do you care what they think? And how do you cut a deal with them when they feel they've got a mandate to drive forward? Well, Kelly, I've worked with them, and I've, I've, I've had the fights I need to have. But as a uh, legislator, I've done it through the years as a county commissioner, state legislator. Even in Washington, when I got the Hometown Heroes Bill passed for our first responders, uh, I was working with a Republican House, Republican Senate, and a Republican president. But we, uh, we had big ideas that, was, that were the right ideas, and we literally forced them 
to let that legislation pass, sign it, and get it done. Same thing happened with our school construction bill. It put, you know, half a billion dollars in North Carolina, 10,000 jobs, $26 billion across America building schools and jobs. So you can do it, but you must stand for the principle. I think you have to have a hard priority you aren't willing to back down from, and, and if they don't want to go with you, you go to the people. We did that with the hometown heroes because we went to every firehouse, and every police department in America, got them to press their legislators, and we got it done. That's the kind of thing you do when, when they don't want to work with you. We've been talking with former Congressman Bob Etheridge. He's in the hunt for the Democratic nomination for governor in North Carolina. Thank you, sir, for uh, attending this interview. Good to have you in the studio. Great to be with you, Kelly. And we're inviting all the gubernatorial candidates in North Carolina to come to this table and have a talk with us. Hope you'll tune in. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.